Today, we're going to learn about our neighbors. Don't worry, I don't mean you're going to have to go outside and knock on the door and ask awkward questions. I mean, today, we're going to explore the vibrant, hot, bright, and beautiful land of Mexico. Not the places you've been on a cruise, but the real Mexico. I'm Scott Parrish, and you're listening to Dying to Eat. Each episode, we'll be focusing on the relationship between food and death around the world. If you love food, culture, and fun stories, then I've got a great show in store for you. So make sure to stick around to the end and see what's cooking this week. And if you're interested in high-quality CBD, please visit our sponsor, thetailoredhemp.com. Legal in all states and ready to answer your questions or guide you to the relief CBD can provide, thetailoredhemp.com. Even though we are somewhat familiar with this country, I think it's important that we go over the geography of it. Mexico is situated in North America. We know, although culturally, it is identified more closely with Central and South American countries. It borders the United States in the north, Guatemala and Belize in the south, the Pacific Ocean in the west, and the Gulf of Mexico in the east. The national territory measures more than 750,000 square miles and contains a wide range of physical environments and natural resources, hence why so many of our beers, liquors, foods are imported from Mexico. Hello, Dos Equis, Tequila, and Modelo. We hope you're listening and hope you had a great Cinco de Mayo. The national capital is Mexico City, situated in the heart of central Mexico. In pre-Columbian times, it was the site of the capital of the Aztec Empire, and during the three centuries of colonial rule, it was the seat of the viceroys of New Spain. Mexico City today is the second largest city in the world, with 17 million inhabitants as of 1995. Most administrative and economic activities are concentrated in Mexico City. We will explore more of Mexico City in our special subject. But first, I want to dive into the amount of current Mexicans that reside in the country. Right now, there are over 100 million people living there. What's even crazier is that number was in the 1950s was approximately 25 million with that figure reaching nearly 50 million in 1970. That's some serious growth. These numbers demonstrate the rapid rate of demographic growth that was so characteristic of Mexico during the second half of the 20th century. The growth rate has slowed, but the population is still very young. Here's an interesting fact I think you guys will enjoy. The average life expectancy in 1999 was estimated at 69 years for men and a little over 75 years for women. The infant mortality rate was almost 25 per 1,000. I'd say they do a pretty good job of keeping those babies alive. Spoken by more than 95% of the population, Spanish is the official language of Mexico and was introduced through conquest and colonization. Mexican Spanish has its roots in the Spanish of Spain. Certain words from the principal Indian language Nahuatl was incorporated into Mexican Spanish, especially in the domain of food and household. Some of these words have been incorporated into other languages, such as English, like the word chocolate, from the uh, Nahuatl chocolito. The national culture of Mexico boasts 62 indigenous languages. In 1995, at least 5.5 million people spoke an indigenous language. The level of bilingualism, however, was high at 85%. (laughs) I can barely hobble some English. Let's back up now to the emergence of the nation, who didn't get its independence until 1821. Mexican national culture slowly emerged from a process of accommodation between the indigenous cultures and the Spanish colonial domination that lasted three centuries. In the 19th century, the formation of the national culture remained a difficult task, mainly due to the political instability, military uprisings, and foreign invasions. In these years, Mexico lost large portions of its original territory. Most important in this respect was the war with the United States between 1846 and 1848. 
which broke out when the United States attempted to annex the independent Texas. The war ended with the U.S. forces defeating the Mexican army. The 1848 Peace Treaty ceded Texas, California, and New Mexico to the United States and reduced Mexico's territory by half. Despite this tragic loss, the war did contribute to the development of a genuine nationalism for the very first time. In 1853, in a contradictory decision, the Mexican government sold present-day southern New Mexico and Arizona to the United States in order to solve budgetary problems. The relationship between Mexico and the United States has remained difficult and ambivalent ever since. Mexico was invaded again in 1862, but this time it was the French who installed a monarch in coalition with conservative Mexican elites. Civil war ensued until the French were defeated by Mexican liberals in 1867, which inaugurated a new republic that was finally becoming a nation-state. These years of growing economic, infrastructural, and political modernization, political stabilization, and economic development were also the hallmarks of the regime of Porfirio Diaz. He ruled between 1876 and 1910. The years of the Diaz regime were also the time when Mexico became increasingly connected to a railroad network. These processes fostered the political, economic, and social integration of different groups and regions within the nation and strengthened the state and nation building. These profound Transformations, however, also created many tensions and conflicts between the rich and the poor, peasants and large landowners, Indians and non-Indians, the politically influential and the aspiring middle classes. This instability eventually led to the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, which drove Diaz out of power and then developed into a harsh and violent civil war. It's estimated that one million people were killed during this revolutionary period. Of the total population that was about 15 million in 1910, you can see where there were a lot of people participating in this war, or at least caught in the crossfire. Armed struggle formally ended with the adoption of the new constitution in the early 1917, but it still took several decades more before a new nation-state consolidated. Post-revolutionary construction affected all domains of society and gave an entirely new meaning to the nation. As a product of Mexican Revolution that took place, the Mexican state has been an important point of convergence for national identity. Because it was a widely shared process that profoundly refashioned the country's social, political, economic, and cultural characteristics, the revolution itself has become an important source of national identity. The post-revolutionary state has been very active and effective in nurturing national symbols and heroes. Children who attended public schools honor the national flag and sing the national anthem every Monday morning. The flag consists of three vertical stripes in the colors green, which represents hope, white, which represents purity, and red, which is blood. In the central white strip is an image of an eagle standing on a cactus plant eating a snake. This image represents the myth of the foundation of the Tinoto Tichlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire. Let's talk about that in a little more, just in a, in a bit, because that's really a bizarre story. According to legend, the wandering Aztecs would know where to build their new city when they saw an eagle perched on a cactus. The image did appear to them, but in an unlikely place, on a tiny, tiny island, in the middle of Lake Texcoco, to build their city, the Aztecs formed a number of small garden islands connected by causeways. Based on a mistranslation of Aztec texts, the snake was later added to the story by the Spanish. Although the Aztecs revered snakes as symbols of wisdom and creation, the first missionaries reinterpreted the image. To the Europeans, it would become... It would come to mean the struggle between good and evil and the triumph of Christian evangelers in Mexico. 
As a Christian, I can tell you we have a long history of taking other people's symbols, holidays, and etc. and making them our own. This is a really good example. So, the flag of Mexico has three vertical stripes, green, white, and red. The design dates back to 1821 when Mexico finally gained its independence from Spain. When these colors were first adopted, the color green was chosen to represent independence from Spain. The red stu stood for union between native people of Mexico and the elites of European heritage, a union that was key to the independence movement. The color white was adopted to represent the purity of Roman Catholicism. Today, no official explanation is given for the colors of the flag, partly because the original meanings have little relevance to modern Mexican society. Yet, a popular explanation has been taken up by many Mexicans. The green is said to represent hope for the nation, the white represents unity, and the red symbolizes the blood of those who died fighting for the nation's independence. The flag is so central to Mexican identity and culture that it has its own national day celebrated on February 24th every year. A flag-raising ceremony with the Mexican president Enrique Pina Nieto ended with embarrassment in 2017 when a giant flag was ripped by a falling metal structure. Now, you think that's the worst that could happen on a flag day ceremony? Just hold on. This one during a military event in Durango, which is in northern Mexico, was an even greater disaster. A sudden gust of wind lifted a giant flag into the air, and a soldier was lifted nearly a hundred feet into the sky. I mean, it was giant. This guy was ripped off the ground by it. You can see it on YouTube. After spinning in the air for a few seconds, he crashed to the ground. Amazingly, this soldier sustained minor injury. It's hilarious and nerve-wracking all at the same time. Of course, it's only funny because the soldier was okay. If you really want to watch the video, check us out on Facebook, where I'll be posting it uh, the Monday after this airs. We can't even for a second discuss Mexico without discussing their delicious food. I don't care what state you live in, you've had some delicious Mexican food, and I know you enjoyed it. Three products constitute the heart of most Mexican dishes. Corn, hot peppers, or chilies, and beans. Oh, and uh, did I say corn already? Corn is consumed in all possible forms. As a cooked or roasted corn cob, which is elote, cooked grain of the corn, porridge, atola, uh, as a wrap and steamed dough with the filling, like, you know, a tamale, but most importantly as a tortilla, a thin round, you know, they're kind of like a pancake. Tortillas are made from corn dough and come in as in many sizes, although the traditional tortilla that accompanies most meals has a, has a diameter of about 6 inches. If you are unaware of this, when tortillas are filled with meat or other ingredients, they are either called tacos or quesadillas, which are especially popular in central Mexico. Much of the sophistication of Mexican food comes from the use of more than 100 different types of chilies which range everything from the large and sweet chili ancho to the small and extremely hot chili habanero. Mexicans generally have a light breakfast of coffee and or fruit before they leave for work or school. Halfway through the morning, people eat a warm tortilla-based snack or a bread roll. The most important meal of the day is served between 2 and 4 in the afternoon. It's called a comidia and consists of three or four courses, soup, rice, or pasta, some type of meat, depending on what's affordable, accompanied by tortillas, refried beans, and dessert. Dinner is served between 8 and 10 at night. Well, that's kind of late for an old man like me. And it consists mainly of sweet rolls, coffee, <laughs> not for me, and milk. Mexicans frequently eat outdoors. Let me go back to that, coffee at night can't do it. I would never sleep. Love caught my coffee in the morning, though. Don't talk to me before I've had a cup. So, homely restaurants serve inexpensive fixed menus known as Coma de Corarita. Mexicans drink huge quantities of soft drinks and beer, although a na national liquor, although the national liquor is tequila, which is produced from uh, a specific cactus, 
Mexicans prefer rum with cola during weddings and other celebrations or fiestas. Speaking of fiestas, there are numerous religious and secular occasions in Mexico that are accompanied by special food. A popular religious fiesta is the Dia de la Candelaria. Now, I hope I got that out right. That was a mouthful. And on February 2nd, that's the time when they celebrate the purification of Mary and the presentation and blessing of Jesus. After the church ceremony, family and close friends join for tamales. And, and I got to tell you, that's my kind of celebration. Let's shift gears for a minute. Let's get off these delicious tamales and let's discuss economy. Mexico has a free market economy with a mixture of modern and traditional industry and agriculture increasingly dominated by the private sector. Until the 1980s, state regulation of economy and protectionist policies were influential, but since the Mexican economy has experienced deregulation, internalization, and privatization, the number of state-owned companies fell from more than 1,000 in 1982 to fewer than 200 in 1998. Economic restructuring was promoted by national and international interest groups in response to several late 20th century economic and financial crises. Although Mexico produces and exports large quantities of oil, the overwhelming majority of exports came from the manufacturing industry. The most important sectors were in diminishing order, machinery, automobiles, textiles, and clothing. Obviously, the United States is by far the most important trading uh, partner, accounting for more than three-quarters of Mexico's imports and exports. Trade with the United States and Canada increased, increased substantially following the implementation in 1994 of the North American Free Trade Agreement. Mexico has a very unequal distribution of wealth, even compared to other Latin American countries. With the introduction of neoliberal economic policies, inequities have sharpened. In 1998, the top 20% of income earners accounted for 55% of Mexico's income, while an estimated 27% of the population was living below the poverty line. The size of the middle classes has shrunk in recent years and continues to do so. Although po poverty and marginalization are widespread, they are particularly strong in central and southern Mexico and especially in, in rural areas. An official marginalization index that includes income levels and the availability and quality of services such as drinking water, sewage, and education indicates that the smallest settlements are the most underprivileged. There is a correlation between the socioeconomical hierarchy and the ethnic ethnicity. Among the poor segments of the population, a strong presence of Indian groups can be found. In 1995, almost all communities whose populations were comprised of more than 40% native language speakers suffered from high degrees of marginalization. This strongly contrasts with the wealthiest segments in the Mexican population, which are predominantly made of white people. Do you think you'd be able to identify a rich person from a poor person? The class differences are actually marked in Mexico and are expressed symbolically in numerous ways. Wealthy, Mex wealthy Mexicans live in neighborhoods that are sealed off by armed private guards. Heck, I thought a security guard at the gated community that I go to every Sunday was pretty fancy, but what do I know? Another interesting cultural maker of class difference is access to all sorts of private facilities. Whereas wealthy people and members of the upper middle class send their children to private schools and universities, use, mean, use private means of transportation, and go to private hospitals and sports clubs, the not-so-well-off make use of crowded state-subsidized facilities. You know, I know it's not the same, but I think I see a little bit of that here, too. Here in the U.S. On the last polling episode, we spoke briefly about marriage norms. Mexicans are free to choose their marriage partners. Informally, however, there are rules that constrain choices, most importantly those related to class and ethnicity. 
People usually marry after a period of formal engagement that can last several years. In 1995, the average age of marriage for a male was 24 years old. For a woman, it was nearly 22 years old. Out of all Mexicans aged 12 and above, just over half were married or otherwise united. I can't imagine. My little girl is in her 20s, and hey man, she's still my little girl. One day though, I know that that right man's going to come along and She'll uh, go that direction as well, but 12 years old, that just blows my mind. Although the basis for marriage is love, many Mexicans consciously or unconsciously look for a partner who can provide social and economic security or upward, or upward mobility. Monogamy is the only marriage form allowed. A marriage ceremony consists of a civil registration and a religious wedding. Afterward, the couple holds a huge and costly party with family and friends. At the beginning of the 1990s, the divorce rate was relatively low. It was about 6.5%. It is legally easy to divorce, but the social pressure against it can be formidable. It seems Mexico has the marriage idea intact and is actually pretty prosperous. If only we could do that in America, where we see a drastic decrease in crime and poverty and drug use, and of course, divorce. Uh, what pairs alongside marriage? Death? Taxes? Religion? Let's explore the common religion in Mexico, then we'll get into the death rituals. Roman Catholicism is the dominant religion in Mexico. After the conquest by the Spanish, Mexico's indigenous people readily accepted uh, Catholic beliefs and practices, but they did so on the basis that their pre-Hispanic religious beliefs stayed intact. The Virgin of Guadalupe, for example, was associated with the pagan goddess Tanacin. As a result, Mexican folk Catholicism is frequently described as syncretic. Catholic beliefs pervade the life of ordinary Mexicans. Because the Catholic Church has been a very powerful institution in Mexican history, its relationship with the state has at times been tense and sometimes it's actually been openly hostile. In recent decades, Protestant missionaries have been particularly active in southern Mexico and among the urban poor. Back to our special segment now. And before we get to the death rites, it's time that we talk a little bit more about Mexico City. The capital of Mexico, which is the largest Spanish-speaking city on Earth. Yes, that's exactly what I said, on Earth. It's also the oldest city in North America. That's pretty astounding. It was founded about 500 years ago on the site of Tenochtitlan, a city that was destroyed by the Spanish conquistadors, which had previously been the capital of the Aztec Empire. The city is actually built on a lake and is actively sinking about four inches a year. So, you know, I guess you can invest in property and pretty soon have lakefront property if you're just patient enough. Although that's kind of alarming, it's totally normal to, to the people that live there and it apparently no threat of a flood in the near future, probably because the city is located and an altitude of more than 6,500 feet above sea level. Since all Mexico lies in a zone of high seismic activity, Mexico City is often shaken by earthquakes. Weak tremors occur almost every day. Now, I've experienced an earthquake, and I can tell you, they're pretty scary. I just don't prefer to live any place where they happen daily. So, here's something I would have never guessed. Traffic jams here are even worse than in New York City or even in London. The road from the center of the suburbs can take three or four hours during rush hours. You could listen to four episodes of Dying to Eat on your way to work or one episode of Joe, the Joe Rogan Experience. Shout out to Joe. We love your podcast, brother. The National University of Mexico is the largest by number of students in the Western Hemisphere. A lot of students must mean a lot of books, right? Well, in fact, there are a lot of bookstores here. 
Reading is popular among the locals, and the reading population is a good indicator of the cultural state of a country. They treat their citizens and tourists good on Sundays. You can actually rent a bike for free. How often do you hear that word? And ride it around the city and hit one of their 100 museums that they have there. <laughs> 100 museums. That's crazy. And that's, all, that's just in one city, right? So people who live in this populated city usually stay here and have kids. The population doubles every 20 years. Man, that's a lot of people. Not only is that a lot of people, that's a lot of cars. And that means a lot of traffic. Well, fear not, the law will intervene. And in order to somehow unload the roads and improve the environment at the same time, the local authorities have adopted an interesting law. Any car older than eight years old is forbidden to operate in the capital for one day every week and at least one Saturday must fall on these days during the month. See where the free bikes on Sundays come in handy? Liking this better all the time. So if you wanted to see a castle while you're there, you would have to go into Mexico City, and you would find the Chipotle Apec Castle. This is the home of Maximilian the, the I of Mexico, the only monarch of the so-called Second Mexican Empire. When you think of Mexico, you don't think of rich, right? Well, Mexico City contributes most, uh, almost one-fifth of Mexico's GDP, about 17%. It is the eighth richest city in the world. That's more, what's more, it's one of the highest economic growth cities in the world, and its economy is expected to double in the next year. More than 20% of the Mexican economy is concentrated in the city, which is why one of the main financial and cultural centers, centers of both Americas and the world is located there. With what makes New York City special in the eyes of the average American? Is it the big buildings, the architecture, Central Park, the subways, all those yellow taxes, taxis? Well, more than 1,400 buildings in Mexico City are considered unique architectural monuments. This is a record number. Oh, and remember that little old Central Park? Well, in Mexico City, the Chipotlepec Forest is the largest urban park in Latin America, and it's twice as big as New York's Central Park. Oh, and Mexico City has the highest taxi population in the world. New York City is looking to knock <laughs> knock them right off, I'm sure, but good luck, New York. Especially after this past year we just had, this, this subway system is one of the largest in Latin America, with 12 lines along 140 miles and 195 stations. Approximately 7 million people use it every day. Now that's crowded. So, representations and rituals of death play a prominent role in popular culture, art, and religion. It has been suggested that this is related to pre-Columbian indigenous beliefs. Such rituals are most vigorously expressed in the festivities of the Days of the Dead. That's on November 2nd and 1st and 2nd. On this occasion, Mexicans arrange altars to the dead in their homes with food, beverages, and other objects, such as uh, skulls made of sugar or maybe chocolate, to welcome them to their return to Earth. Many Mexicans also visit churchyards and adorn the graves with large orange flowers. They will spend some time by the grave praying, but also sharing memories about the deceased. This so-called Mexican cult of the dead has attracted much attention abroad, but most funerals are more modern and similar to those of ours in the U.S. Let's go over to let's go over it in more detail. In the Mexican culture, it's common to hold a death vigil or a wake immediately after the death. The body is present for the vigil, and the family surrounds it in prayer for up to 48 consecutive hours. A Mexican wake customarily features an open casket and photos of the dead that are displayed as a tribute. So, guys, if I die on vacation in Mexico, please make sure there are pictures of me alive so I can be part of the wake. Thank you. Hey, Pete, you're my witness here. 
The family or family friends may serve food at the wake in a separate room. There may even be games like dominoes. When do Latinos not look for an opportunity to play dominoes? How random. <laughs> so anyway, visitors are encouraged to spend time in both spaces. This time, this way they can offer their condolences and join the family in prayer, as well as celebrate the life of the deceased. Many families choose to hold the wake in their own homes. However, they may also hold the wake in a mortuary. The wake isn't a somber affair, but a loud and social one. Children take part and listen to the stories about their family members passed on. That's the way I like it. I hope that that's the way mine is. And it, which is rather sweet, I know. And the way it should be, well, that's just my opinion. That's the way it should be. Unlike flipping chairs and making human soup like we saw in some of our previous episodes, I can get much more on board with a Mexican funeral. A Mexican funeral usually takes place in a Catholic church. Otherwise, another church or community space may be used for funeral services. Ancient Mexican tradition called for family members to wrap their loved one's dead body in a mat, which after cremation would take place. The family would leave the person's ashes in a ceremonial hut for nine days. Then, and only then, was the deceased ready to pass to the afterlife. I don't know, that sounds kind of boring. For nine days, you got to sit around and, and wait till it's your turn to go. Maybe it's all that traffic, I don't know. So, today's customs follow a similar pattern. Family members gather and pray for nine days. However, a modern... Modern Mexicans tend to prefer burial over cremation because of the importance of being able to return to visit their loved ones as part of, guys, I'm not, I don't speak Spanish. I've already been teased about this. I'm going to do the best I can. As part of Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. Because of that tradition, the practice, like scattering ashes, uh, would not be typical. Regardless of what the family decides, the most important part is that their loved one has been laid to rest in a permanent place. It's also common for Mexican people who have moved abroad to travel back to Mexico for burial. This allows a person to find their final resting place next to family members and ancestors. After a death, family members hold the responsibility to keep their loved ones from being forgotten. They fulfill that responsibility by visiting the grave each year and celebrating the Day of the Dead, and All Souls Day. Special and additional mourning rituals take place within the first days and months after the death. As mentioned above, or as I mentioned before, I guess I should say, the, the family will traditionally pray for their loved ones for nine days. After those nine days are up, the family will continue to pray and recite the rosary of the deceased for at least once per month. After a year, They'll recite the rosary for that person at least once a year. If the family is Catholic, they may also say Mass for the deceased on the 3rd, 7th, and 13th day after their death. <laughs> you better mark your calendar. That's a lot of praying. Funerals in Mexico are culturally unique. They maintain a secure connection to the history and folklore of Mexican people while also incorporating modern practices. The ancient rites of the Day of the Dead celebration is a bit on the extreme side. Let's talk about that. Why celebrate the dead? This ancient ritual is often mistaken for Halloween in America, but it's way far from that. The Day of the Dead is a mixture of Mesoamerican, which is, we're talking about Aztec, Mexicana, and Catholic rituals. The holiday celebrated on November 1st is dedicated to the children or limbos who died without baptism and were forgotten. The continuation of this holiday is celebrated on November 2nd, All Souls Day, which is dedicated to the adults. Festivities start around October 28th and progress from there. During the festivities, the dead are not mourned, but remembered. Again, I love this thing. I, I may just have to die in Mexico. This tradition isn't new by any stretch. It, actually, it's ancient. In fact, its roots go back more than 3,000 years. 
During this time, the dead cross paths with the living while the veil is thin between the two worlds. It's the time in which the temporary return for the deceased relatives and the loved ones are commemorated. The living build altars to their dead that are composed of skulls made of sugar and chocolate, pictures of people that have passed away, candles, picadillo paper, marigolds, and water and food. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The oral tradition of Ketosol Waddle, which is bringing man back to life from dead bones, can show us how life is born out of death. This is the duality of the ancient Me Mexicans and is a deep ingrained belief. The ancient people did not leave behind food or ailments. They left behind jewelry, flowers, and celebrated with dances. The festival that was converted to Day of the Dead and, and let me make a note here. The Spaniards used All Saints Day and the fateful Dead Day. So the festival that was converted to the Day of the Dead was once commemorated on the ninth month of the Aztec solar calendar in the beginning of August. They buried their dead with Cholot's Queen Way that represented a divinity called Axolotl, which is the Nahua word for dog. That's a lot to unpack. This divinity helped the dead travel through the underworld to their final resting place. The most familiar symbol of Dia los de Mortos may be the skeletons and skulls which appear everywhere during the holiday. In, in candied sweets, in parade masks, in dolls, skeletons and skulls are almost always patrolled portrayed as enjoying life, and they are often in fancy clothing and in entertainment situations. If you've seen the Disney movie Coco, that is where the inspiration for the movie came from. For the Mexicans, death did not have a negative moral connotation like the ones in the religion of the Spaniards. They did not have to the, the concept of heaven or hell as punishment or reward. On the contrary, they knew the paths of our tonal and or our light bodies were determined to take by the type of death that was experienced. Death in these cultures is not death, but renewal and transformation. Think of transformation like a caterpillar tra uh, transforms. A caterpillar makes a cocoon to transform so essentially it dies and then it's reborn. Energy doesn't die. It only transforms. We must die to awaken. <laughs> wow, that's kind of deep. So let's get into what we were all really here for. The food. A delicious recipe crafted from Yucatan area of Mexico. I think you're really going to love this one and it'll add a great value to your week. First up, we've got pickled onions, which is part of the recipe. I think you got two for here. Because I'm going to talk about the onions that go with the meat, and I'm going to talk about the meat. So the pickled onions. You need one red onion sliced into thin slivers, two, two teaspoons of ground black pepper, three teaspoons of allspice, two bay leaves, and two-thirds cup each of orange juice, lime juice, and grapefruit juice, and a quarter cup of water, and a half teaspoon of salt. Mix all except the onions in a bowl. Stir until all the solids are incorporated into the liquid. Place the onions in the jar, in a um, mason jar is what I normally use, but place the onions in the jar and fill it with the liquid. Cap it and put it in the refrigerator, and it's good for a couple of weeks. Now remember, when you eat it, only eat the onions. So the other half of this recipe is the Cocha Nita Pabil, which is pork. And that's what we're going to start with, four pound boneless pork roast. For the marinade, and this is going to be real easy because we're going to mix it all together and pour it over the pork and then let it sit for overnight. So you need one head of garlic that's charred. And the way I cook mine is I put mine in the air fryer for 10 minutes or until it's soft. Now, also what you can do is you can coat it with oil and place it in the oven at 350 degrees for 20 minutes. It's up to you charred garlic. 
2 teaspoons of corn oil, 2 tablespoons of oregano, quarter teaspoon of ground cloves, half a teaspoon of ground cinnamon, 2 tablespoons of cracked whole black peppercorns, 1 teaspoon, or excuse me, 1 tablespoon of cumin, 1 tablespoon of allspice, half a cup of orange juice, half a cup of lime juice, half a cup of grapefruit juice, and half a cup of white vinegar, 1 tablespoon of soy sauce, 1 tablespoon of salt, 3 tablespoons ground smoked paprika, 2 teaspoons of garlic powder. When you remove the meat from the marinade, let it let the roast rest for about 30 minutes. Cook it on indirect heat on your grill until 160 degrees internal temp, which is about 45 minutes per pound. Mop the marinade that you have left over every 45 minutes or so. And when you get through, just throw whatever marinade you have left, just throw it away. Let the meat sit after cooking until it's cool enough to shred by hand. And just any large pieces of fat, throw them in the garbage. Okay, by the way, I haven't forgotten. Since we're talking about food, let me ask you a question. Why do cars in Mexico have cheese in the glove compartment? <laughs> it's funny because I can see Pete grimacing over there. He knows what's coming. In case of emergency. <laughs> I've been your host, Scott Parrish. And I can't even say my name now. I've been your host, Scott Parrish. And I'd like to thank you for listening to Dying to Eat. This show is made possible by listeners like Alice Rocco in California and Danielle Bedell in Birmingham, Alabama. I really do appreciate your support. I appreciate everyone's support. If you like what you've heard and you'd like to hear more, look out for new episodes every week on your favorite podcast platform. Make sure to drop us a like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on what's going on. And until next time, stay lively.